from around the globe in sold out arenas and humble churches from out on the streets to your screen and now the time and what must be done on this edition of Farrakhan Speaks Greetings to you. I am Minister Louis Farrakhan, National Representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that great preacher of freedom, justice, and equality to the black man and woman of America and the Western Hemisphere, and to the Aboriginal people of the earth, the eternal leader of the nation of Islam, and a warner to the government and people of the United States of America and a warner to the nations of the earth. In this, our concluding series of broadcasts on the time and what must be done, I'd like to talk with you about the shadow government that hides the knowledge of this great wheel, even from the president's of the United States that the American people have elected and we will offer final guidance to our president and nation. A command by Allah to people of righteousness is contained in the Holy Quran chapter 2 titled The Cow verse 42. It reads and mix not up truth with falsehood, nor hide the truth while you know. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in his monumental book, Our Savior Has Arrived, in an article titled The Hidden Truth, on page 10, he writes, quote, Hiding the truth is a very serious thing to do. It causes harm and disappointment and causes one to be misled. It causes loss of property and life. It causes the loss of friendship, beloved ones, and loss of confidence and trust. In court, it causes heavy penalties and someone's being sent to prison or to death for that of which they are innocent. The greatest and the gravest of all is the slave master's hiding of the truth that will exalt and save his slave. This is that great truth that white America is hiding from her once slaves the black man and woman. The white people know of and see the salvation of their slaves that is now present. They are doing everything they possibly can to deceive the black man and woman into thinking that they, our former slave masters, hold out greater and better promises for a future to the black man and woman in America than Almighty God Allah. This will deceive many of our people. Read the seventh surah or chapter of the Holy Quran where the devil is made to confess his deceiving of the people in these words, quote, Allah promised you a promise of truth. I promised you, then failed to fulfill. The government of the United States of America and the scientists in her government have known about the presence of this great wheel since the 1940s 
when they raided the home and the temple of the nation of Islam and took from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad the writings of Master Farad Muhammad to him and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's writings and drawings of the wheel. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said the FBI bore witness to him that they had seen it and of course what he was teaching was the truth. He said one FBI official took a pistol and put it to his head and said, quote, I ought to blow your brains out, close quote. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, quote, you will if it pleases Allah, but if it doesn't please Allah, you won't, close quote. And the enemy said to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, had you taught this 20 years earlier, you would have been shot outright. But in other words, you are on time, so go and teach your people. From that day and from before that day, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been teaching and the government of the United States has been hiding the truth from not only the American people, but they made the knowledge of this great wheel above top secret. And top secret is the hydrogen bomb. And the mother plane, this great wheel, was a top secret above that. The knowledge of this has been hidden from them forbidden to the elected presidents of the United States of America. Knowing that their term in office would only be four years or eight years, they forbade the presidents to know this, fearing that after they left office, they might inform the American people of what they knew. So the scriptures in the book of Ephesians the sixth chapter, the 11th to the 13th verses of the King James Version reads, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. In the Holy Quran, Chapter 21, titled The Prophets, in verses 17 and 18, it reads, Had we wished to take a pastime, we would have taken it from before ourselves. By no means would we do so. Nay, we hurl the truth against falsehood so it knocks out its brains and, lo, it vanishes, and woe to you for what you describe. And in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 3rd to the 5th verses, in the King James Version, it reads, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The government of the United States has 
spent billions of dollars to confuse the American people, to hide the truth, to pay off even scientists to develop an elaborate scheme to confuse the minds of the public. And when people have come forth saying what they actually saw and what they actually experienced, and members of the government would visit those who said what they saw or knew and frighten them that if they ever told what they saw or what they knew, the consequences could be they would be discredited or even put to death. Let me ask us this. How much of this knowledge about the reality of the great wheel, the mother plane, do you believe has been denied to presidents elected by the American people and other members of Congress, governors and other legislators? As we mentioned to you in edition 51 of the time and what must be done, a National Geographic Channel poll conducted in June 2012 about UFOs showed that 79% of Americans believe that there is a government cover-up about UFOs. In an ABC News report published on December 9th, 2013, by Annetta Constantinides, she references remarks made by President Obama to actress Shirley MacLaine about Area 51. Let's take a look at this video clip. Uh, when you first become president, one of the peop uh, questions that people ask you is, uh, what's really going on at Area 51? <laughs> when I wanted to know, I called Shirley MacLaine. I think I just became the first president to ever publicly mention Area 51. <laughs> How's that? So, so, as you have just heard, this is not an insignificant reference by President Obama to Shirley MacLaine and Area 51. As an Oscar, Golden Globe, and Emmy winning actress, she has been known for decades to discuss her experiences with UFOs. As a proponent of New Age philosophy, which deals with a spirituality without borders or confining dogmas, and metaphysics, which deals with the underlying theoretical principles of a subject or field of inquiry, and the theological doctrine of causation, she has discussed in television interviews and in her books her beliefs and experiences with UFOs. According to Wikipedia, quote, she has given numerous interviews on CNN, NBC, and Fox News channels on the subject during 2007-2008. In her book, Saging While Aging, published in 2007, she described alien encounters and witnessing of Washington, D.C. UFO incidents in the 1950s. In the April 2011 edition of the Oprah show, McLean stated that she and her neighbor observed numerous UFO incidents at her New Mexico ranch for extended periods of time, close quote. We believe such reference underscores 
an awareness by the president of this matter and his awareness of the interest of the American people about this issue of UFOs. According to a special report sponsored and funded by billionaire philanthropists Lawrence S. Rockefeller entitled The UFO Briefing Document The Best Available Evidence and published by the UFO Research Coalition in 1995 comments on the issue of government secrecy on page three and four. It reads in part, quote, in the case of UFO phenomena, the question must be asked, what would give an unelected government official the right to keep this information to himself, thereby depriving the rest of the world of possible knowledge of almost inconceivable magnitude and consequence. Such elitism by the officials of any government, much less a government based on the principles of democracy and individual rights, is a gross injustice, not only to its own people, but to all people. Secrecy, like power, lends itself to abuse. Behind the shield of secrecy, it is possible for an agency or service to avoid scrutiny and essentially to operate outside of the law. Numerous high-ranking government officials have been denied access to the knowledge of what you call UFOs. They include former President Bill Clinton, who said in a speech in Hong Kong in 2005, quote, I did attempt to find out if there were any secret government documents that reveal things, and if there were, they were concealed from me too, close quote. Our research has indicated that an important relationship existed between the Clintons, especially Hillary Clinton with Mr. Lawrence Rockefeller. According to Mr. J. Antonio Hunius, one of the co-authors of the UFO briefing document in an article entitled The Lorenz Rockefeller UFO Initiative, he writes on Mr. Rockefeller, quote, Mr. Rockefeller's activities included lobbying at the highest level, President Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham Clinton long before the term exopolitics was in vogue, Lawrence Rockefeller was practicing it in the White House from 1993 to 1996. This has come to be known as the Rockefeller UFO Initiative, a multi-pronged campaign to get the U.S. government to release sensitive information on UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence. But what is exopolitics? It is the art or science of government as concerned with creating or influencing policy toward phenomena and extraterrestrial beings. The article continues, quote, the initiative is documented in hundreds of pages of correspondence released 
a few years ago by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy under the Freedom of Information Act. According to the article, two meetings took place in 1993 and 94 with Dr. John Gibbons, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy during the Clinton administration with Mr. Rockefeller and his team to discuss declassifying documents concerning the existence of UFOs. The article further indicates that in late August 1995, the Clinton family went on vacation at Lawrence Rockefeller's J.Y. Ranch next to the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And also, according to Grant Cameron, Rockefeller briefed both the President and First Lady at the J.Y. Ranch, but unfortunately, there is no documentation of what was discussed. The actions of the shadow government in denying access to information concerning UFOs is expressed in author Timothy Good's 1988 published book entitled Above Top Secret, The Worldwide UFO Cover Up. On pages 416 and 417, he discusses the refusal of the United States government through the National Security Agency to release documents concerning UFOs. He writes, thanks to citizens against UFO secrecy, lawyer Peter Gersten filed the request under the Freedom of Information Act for documents on UFOs originating with the National Security Agency. But he was informed that the documents were exempt from disclosure. National Security Agency Representative Eugene Yates admitted in a court hearing that the National Security Agency had found a total of 239 documents on UFOs that were relevant to the Freedom of Information Act request. Following another refusal to release more documents, Peter Gersten filed suit against the National Security Agency on behalf of the Citizens Against UFO Secrecy in the District Court of Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1980 to obtain the 135 documents then admitted to being withheld by the agency. Judge Gessel studied a 21-page National Security Agency affidavit in camera, which means in judges' chambers in private, and ruled that the agency was fully justified in withholding the documents in their entirety. The judge's decision in its memorandum opinion and order granted dismissal in part, it says, throughout the court's review of this material. The court has been aware of the public interest in the issue of UFOs and the need to balance that interest against the agency's need for secrecy. The in-camera affidavit presents factual considerations which aided the court 
in determining that the public interest in disclosure is far outweighed by the sensitive nature of the materials and the obvious effect on national security their release may well entail. The judge therefore said the case is dismissed. In other words, there's something so relevant to national security that it far outweighs the need of the public and even the presidents to know about these unidentified flying objects. Since this is public record and other things are public record, what was denied to presidents that is considered above top secret? What is it? And what would it be except that it would be some greater knowledge of the wheel, its power, and the reality of its occupants? They don't mind you knowing that something is out there that is flying around because practically every president in recent history knew that because they said they have seen it. But when they dug to get the deeper aspects of what they have seen and what has been learned, they were shut down. So who is this shadow government? that denies the person voted in to be the president of the United States, this critical knowledge of what is above our heads that can be our friend or our enemy. If America allows the wheel to be your friend, it will be your best friend. And if you allow it to be your enemy, it will be the worst enemy that you have ever had because that enemy can and will destroy you completely from the face of the earth. You are in the valley of decision, America. You are holding the secret of the reality of the wheels from presidents who have one or two terms and congresspersons, governors, and other legislators that have limited terms and you don't want them to go out of office and share what they know. So the president in this respect, as well as in other respects, is not the main power. He's subject to other forces in America. And it is time that the American people know that our president in being denied this most important knowledge can be made a shadow in his presidency of those that know and refuse to share that knowledge. In a CNN interview, with Don Lemon on March 7, 2007, I was asked about my views about then candidate for president Barack Obama. This interview was done two months after I underwent a 14 hour operation and made Savior's Day. 2007, and as a result of my speech, for two hours, the media was interested in knowing what is keeping this man alive. So Don Lemon from CNN came to our home in Chicago to interview me. Please listen to my response on this video clip. Talking about Democrats, one of which who's running for president who lives in your very neighborhood. 
What do you think of him? I like him very much. I'm not saying that I'm going to vote for him, but I like him because he's fresh. He doesn't come with a lot of the baggage that those in politics that have been in politics and been corrupted almost, or not almost, corrupted by it, sold out to the moneyed interests, sold out to the multinational corporations, sold out to the international bankers. So when you look at Bush, you think you're looking at the president? There's another power behind him. When you look at Blair, you think you're looking at the, the, the prime minister? You, there's another power behind him. When you look at Merkel in Germany, you think you're looking at the head of state? But there's another power behind these people. And the powers that are, are dogging the whole world are the international bankers that finance both sides of a conflict. Do you think that Barack Obama is the answer to George Bush? No. I think he's capable of being an answer. But the powers that contend with presidents, I'll go back to President Jimmy Carter. When he was a governor running for the presidency, he saw UFOs. And he said when he became president, he was going to open the file, which is secret held by the government. When he got in office, we didn't hear any more from him. People say things when they're running because they don't know the powers that really control the house that they're going to live in. And that's why Barack Obama is clean. He's, he's fresh. But the powers are eating at him right now. The powers that want to control him are at him right now. And how can he get to be president unless he raises a hundred million dollars? And who of the poor people have a hundred million dollars to give him? And who will provide him with the money so he can contend with Mrs. Clinton and her big bank or Giuliani and McCain and their growing bank? So the people that bankroll you, they're the ones that ultimately call the tune. So what are so, you saying? I'm saying that no matter who sits in the White House, if you don't uproot the structure that corrupts them, you still don't have a president. You have a figurehead. And frankly, that's why I say America needs a regime change. And just like you have to go into the floor when there's pipes underneath it that break and bust, you've got to uproot what's under the government of the United States of America or the American people will never have what the Constitution guarantees. Do you think Barack Obama can do that? No. Absolutely not. He's a good person. And he's looking at this thing with the beautiful heart, the beautiful eye of a beautiful person. He doesn't, he knows some of the ugliness of politics because he's been in it long enough. But the real wickedness of the face of politics, you're looking right into the face of Satan himself. And Satan doesn't intend to be uprooted by an upstart from Chicago or Miss Clinton from New York. Satan is the boss. This is his world. And he can only be uprooted by the one that is anointed with power to uproot Satan. And that is the Mahdi or the Christ that comes into the world. Then who can do it? Who can uproot that? I just right? said it. <laughs> but you don't None know. of these. These are victims of satanic influence. Religion is controlled by Satan. That's why religion is ineffective. The divisions in the Muslim world, that's satanic. Muslim killing Muslim? Muslim bombing another mosque of a Muslim? If they did, that's un-Islamic. We've become so insane because of injustice. If we strap a bomb on ourselves and go kill another human being that didn't bother you, this is madness. And that's why the Mahdi or the Christ must come into the world to clean up religion. Because the church's garment is dirty and it needs washing. The bridegroom is coming 
and the bride has dirtied her garment with adultery because she's gotten in bed with the world. <laughs> so, if that happens through a person, just as Jesus walked the earth, is there a person you think that's on this earth now, or that will come, who can do that, who can uproot the evil? That's why we say that Allah came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad because we believe that this human being is clothed in the power of the eternal God to set up the kingdom of God on earth. And there's no one here now that you see has, a, has those qualities. He's here. He's around. That's why the world is in the shape that it's in. That's why you see the clashing because his aim is to set down every tyrant. And he's called in the Quran, Maliki Yaumiddin. He's master of the law of requital, master of the day of judgment, master of the day of religion. He's a human, but he's in the world to do a job, and the job is being done. The house is being divided. The house is being set up on one side, not black and white, but on one side wrong and one side right. Which side do we want to be on? Bush is wrong. He must get right. The government is wrong. It must get right. And we in the black community, the black community is living wrong. And it must get right. We have to choose today between two signs, one of life and one of death. And if we make the wrong choice, we get the right answer. Is there someone which is death? Senator Daniel K. Inouye from Hawaii stated in his concluding remarks in 1987 during the Iran Contra hearings his concern about this shadow government. He said, quote, did this unseemly chapter in our history result from the disregard of our laws and constitution by well-intentioned patriotic zealots who believed in the doctrine espoused by Marxists that the ends justify the means? Or are we here today because of the inadequacy of our laws and constitution? One vision was described in the testimony of Admiral Poindexter, Lieutenant Colonel North, and General Secord, and Mr. Hakeem, that of a secret government directed principally by the National Security Council staffers accountable to not a single elected official, including apparently the president himself. A shadowy government with its own air force, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. It is an elitist vision of government that trusts no one, not the people, not the Congress, and not the cabinet. It is a vision of a government operated by persons convinced they have a monopoly on truth. So the Constitution is already being nullified by this shadowy government. Today, this shadow government appears to be comprised of various agencies and departments within and across branches of the government that form a massive intelligence 
apparatus. It is not that each agency knows all of this. It is individuals, and they know in part, but only a very, very few have the full knowledge, and if they break the secret, then you may find them dead somewhere. This is a secret that you are not allowed to know and if you know you are under surveillance and the threat of death accompanies you and your family. For example, the Huffington Post published an article on December 12th, 2011, entitled, quote, Former CIA Director's Death Raises Questions, Divides Family. Close quote. It reads in part, quote, a new film on the life and death of master spy and former CIA director William E. Colby, created by his son, raises the question of whether the man who pioneered U.S. counterinsurgency warfare may have ended his own life, a question that has divided the intelligence community and Colby's family. When Colby vanished in rough waters on a late night solo canoe trip in 1996, local sheriffs ruled out suicide before they even found his body. A lifetime of espionage meant Colby had enemies from Baltimore to Bali in Indonesia. And conspiracy theories about his death still circulate between Georgetown mansions and CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia today, despite an official ruling of accidental death. Among historians, William Colby is best remembered as the man who gave away the CIA's family jewels, details about covert actions the agency carried out between 1950 and the end of the Vietnam War. Colby was ordered to release them to Congress as part of the church committee hearings of 1975, but many of his colleagues at the time considered it a major betrayal. Could this have been a reason for his questionable death? How many more government officials have met their death under questionable circumstances. All of these agencies and branches of government are engaged in intelligence activities through what is termed black budget operations. The definition of the term black budget is of or relating to covert intelligence operations. What is the definition of covert? It means concealed, secret, disguised, covered, sheltered. In an article published on August 29th, 2013, in the Washington Post titled, U.S. spy networks, successes, failures, and objectives detailed in Black Budget Summary by Barton Gelman and Greg Miller, Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper Jr. takes the position that the details of intelligence activities shouldn't be publicly disclosed. 
he states quote our budgets are classified he said as they could provide insight for foreign intelligence services to discern our top national priorities capabilities and sources and methods that allow us to obtain information to counter threats close quote in a paper titled the black budget report an investigation into the cia's black budget and the second manhattan project dated november the 23rd 2003 and revised february 5th 2004 by michael e sala phd from the center for global peace school of international service at american university washington dc he indicates that in 1947 the national security act created the national security council the central intelligence organization and consolidated the u.s military into one entity the department of defense and there arose an issue over the secrecy of the cia budget the constitution requires transparency and public disclosure of expenditures of all public monies as a result of this issue in 1949 another cia act was passed by congress with additions to the law that allowed secrecy of cia expenditures notwithstanding the constitution today this law still exists and is contained in title 50 of the united states code section 403 j b titled central intelligence agency appropriations expenditures it reads in paragraph b the sums made available to the agency may be expended without regard to the provisions of law and regulations relating to the expenditure of government funds and for objects of a confidential extraordinary or emergency nature such expenditures to be accounted for solely on the certificate of the director and every such certificate shall be deemed a sufficient voucher for the amount therein certified that's really bad when you've got billions of taxpayers dollars that nobody can question how that money is used and where that money goes let's just say for argument's sake when oliver north was in the basement of the white house doing something that i'm sure president reagan was aware of because it was a part of the conspiracy that ran from my judgment like this we know we can't according to the law use taxpayers money to fund the contras in nicaragua because the congress had already said that they would not make money available for that operation so the white house had to find a way around the law so now you have black ops black budgets that you can't see where the monies go so in order to fight the growth of socialism and communism in central and south america 
President Reagan asked King Fahd of Saudi Arabia to give $10 million, maybe more, to arm the Contras in Nicaragua. But again, there is money that was used to bring drugs into the United States. And remember, they have their own navy, they have their own army, and these drugs went into the black community and the money gained from the sales of drugs were used to buy weapons to fund the Contras and other operations throughout the world. This shows that there are plenty of loopholes in government that people who have strange agendas and wish to utilize the government to facilitate their agendas they use these loopholes. So these black ops with their black budgets carry out hidden agendas. So in all of this, the American people end up being a party to something done in their name that they are oblivious to and unfortunately have to bear the consequences of. That's what is so bad about corrupt leadership. In the Washington Post article we mentioned earlier, based on information given by Edward Snowden, it details how the U.S. allocated $52.6 billion in 2013 for the black budget. It states that the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the National Reconnaissance Office receive more than 68% of that black budget. The National Geospatial Intelligence Program's budget has grown over 100% since 2004. In a Scientology publication titled, All About Radiation, a lecture is published by L. Ron Hubbard titled Man's Inhumanity to Man at the Royal Empire Society Hall in London between the 12th and 15th of April 1957. He speaks on the revolt of the American nuclear physicists after the making of the atomic bomb. He writes, quote, at the end of World War II, a friend of mine, Lieutenant Commander of the Coast Guard, Johnny Arwine and myself, went to the California Institute of Technology to meet with a great many old-time atomic physicists who had been at the project that dropped the original bomb from Alemogordo. It was our intention to organize these people so that some sort of sensible control could be monitored across the bomb. Nobody had thought about it at this date, and Johnny Arwine and I were still in uniform. We were both in the world of engineering, then in the world of arts, and then finally in the service. Neither of us had a thing to do with atomic fission in its development. We got these atomic physicists together. I took the chair and our wine addressed them. We spoke of using a propaganda weapon against anyone who would use atomic fission 
further against the human race we planned to use any means we had to educate the people in the world concerning this the nuclear physicists were already so furious about this that our wine and i could not control the meeting we could keep them in their place tell them to talk but we couldn't get across any thought that was even rationally workable these men said one thing we wish to overthrow the government of the united states by force that is an astonishing chapter in the field of nuclear physics which only a few of us know about there was a revolt and later on offices opened in the united states to propagandize the public in a movement led by the late albert einstein awine and i failed and withdrew our support from that meeting and did our best to calm them we reported the findings to the navy department and the president we said that we could not associate our names with this organization but the atomic physicist did try and he's not going to do much more because albert einstein is dead the other day i read the list of atomic scientists who are now dead it is practically the whole roster they died of leukemia cancer and the very diseases radiation sickness breeds they died to a mock degree of radiation mostly i suppose mentally because they had exerted a tremendous overt act against the world and had been unable to repair it in any way scientists brothers and sisters are different from the average phd scientists have a scientific method of proving or disproving the cause and effect so scientists are critical in this hour because the scientists do not believe in a mystery god they don't agree with religion as the world expresses religion because religion does not withstand the scientific analysis so science and religion and mathematics and religion are actually one as the honorable elijah muhammad taught us and any religion that does not find congruency with science and mathematics and is not rooted in the universal order of things is a religion that can be considered as the socialists and communists have said as the opiate of the masses the reason that the wheel is so important I had my research team to look at every field of science that the wheel has garnered their observation and scientific analysis and there is no branch of science that's left out of admiration wonderment in their study of the wheel These scientific disciplines include physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, aerospace, mechanical, chemical, material, electrical, civil, environmental, architectural and aircraft engineering, communications, 
space propulsion, nuclear science, microbiology, genetic engineering, anatomy, ergonomics, botany, horticulture, toxicology, archaeology, linguistics, hieroglyphics, Arabic, philosophy, history, and paranormal communications. So the scientists, if they were gathered together to look at Area 51, they could determine the truth of what we are saying, that God is really present in the world because the wisdom on the wheel and from the wheel is so magnificent it forces every branch of science to bow down when scientists of every branch are met with overwhelming superior knowledge of their discipline by something that actually exists they have to know that the supreme scientist, the supreme being is present. And who is the supreme scientist? It's the presence of the supreme being in a human being, the master of the wheel. And that's why this whole object of science is critical and how the scientists works. You don't allow the scientists, no matter how brilliant they are, to know the full range of what you have in mind. They do their part. And that's the way Master Farad Muhammad guided the building of the wheel. He didn't let those scientists know all that they were working on. You do your part and you do your part. And then at the end, he put it together with a very few and guided the development of the wheel and the 1500 little wheels that occupy the great wheel. Or oh, there may have been thousands working on it, never knowing what they were working on. What was Master Farad Muhammad doing in America for 20 years before he met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and manifested himself to us in 1930? He went in and out of institutions of higher learning. He met many scholars and scientists. He met with people in many different fields of science, religion, and influenced their thinking. He was learning who might be able to be used to bring about an effect in America that would fulfill his will. What a man, what a man. According to Mr. Richard Dolan, government secrecy is a threat to democracy. Mr. Dolan, described on his web page as being among the world's leading researchers and historians of the UFO subject, gave testimony at the citizens' hearings on disclosure on April 30th, 2013, concerning government secrecy being a threat to democracy. He states, quote, we are so busy congratulating ourselves on being a free society that many people have forgotten actually to look long and hard at what kind of system has been evolving over the years. Former President Eisenhower warned many years ago of the dangers posed by the growing military industrial complex. Indeed, our nation and world have transformed so radically since that time, but yet 
we still use the same terminology as before. We talk about democracy and Republican institutions, but these are meaningless words today. If citizens are shut out from what they need to know in order to govern, by removing such key information, the result is that citizens become infantilized, ignorant, dulled, distracted, and no longer able to fulfill the critical role they need to play in order to maintain a free society. If you are keeping from citizens who are being elected to govern such critical knowledge and you are still using the terms democracy and republican institutions, but from the setting up of secret or black budgets to hide the knowledge of what you are doing, you have started down the slippery slope of destroying democracy, destroying the Constitution, destroying Republican institutions. So today, you still use the word democracy, you still use the word republic, but this is all being destroyed. So the citizens are being infantilized which means to keep from maturing, to make somebody infantile, or to keep somebody in an infantile state, to treat as a baby, to treat somebody as, or consider somebody to be infantile. You have become an infant and infants can be easily led around by people who don't consider themselves infants because they know what those who are being infantilized don't know. So what you are saying is you have people in government who have the look of power, but the knowledge that is with those who have infantilized them is guiding their ignorance. They're dull, they're distracted, and they are no longer able to fulfill the critical role they need to in order to maintain a free society. Look at the confusion in the government. And why are the American people so disillusioned now with their leaders from the president on down? So as the former governor and U.S. Senator Huey Long from Louisiana said, quote, when fascism comes to America, it will come wrapped in the American flag. Close quote. What were some of the views that Senator Long expressed that give us insight as to why he made such a statement? Listen to these words from an excerpt of a speech in 1932 in the Senate posted on an educational website shown below. This great and grand dream of America that all men are created free and equal, endowed with the inalienable right of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, this great dream of America, this great light and this great hope has almost gone out of sight in this day and time, and everybody knows it. And there's a mere candle flicker here and yonder to take the place of what the great dream of America was supposed to be. 
The people of this country have fought and have struggled trying by one process and the other to bring about the change that would save the American country to the ideal and purposes of America. They are met with the Democratic Party at one time and the Republican Party at another time and both of them at another time and nothing can be squeezed through these party organization that goes far enough to bring the American people to a condition where they have such a thing as a livable country. We swapped the tyrant 3,000 miles away for a handful of financial slave-owning overlords who make the tyrant of Great Britain seem mild. On this point of the suffering of the mass poor of America, he stated in the U.S. Senate in 1935, the 125 million people of America have seated themselves at the barbecue table to consume the products which have been guaranteed to them by their Lord and Creator. There is provided by the Almighty what it takes for them all to eat, yea, more. There is provided more than what is needed for all to eat, but the financial masters of America have taken off the barbecue table 90% of the food placed there on by God through the labors of mankind even before the feast begins and there's left on that table to be eaten by 125 million people less than should be there for 10 million of them. What has become of the remainder of those things placed on the table by the Lord for the use of us all? They are in the hands of the Morgans, the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Baruchas, the Bakers, the Astors, and the Vanderbilts. 600 families at the most either possessing or controlling the entire 90% of all that is in America. They cannot eat the food, they cannot wear the clothes, so they destroy it. They have it rotted, they plow it up, they pour it into the rivers, they bring destruction through the acts of mankind to let humanity suffer, to let humanity go naked, to let humanity go homeless, so that nothing may occur that will do harm to their vanity and to their greed. Like the dog in the manger, they command a wagon load of hay, which the dog would not allow the cow to eat though he could not eat it himself. Huey Long concludes his 1932 Senate speech with these words. Unless we provide for the redistribution of wealth in this country, the country is doomed. There's going to be no country left here very long. That may sound a little bit extravagant, but I tell you that we are not going to have this good little America here long if we do not take to redistribute the wealth of this country. A biography of Senator Long on the website www.hueylong.com states, quote, Huey accused both parties of selling out to big business at the expense 
of the American people. He became very unpopular with the political establishment in Washington and was labeled a socialist, a radical, a demagogue, a dictator. Regarding his views on the political parties, Senator Long stated, the only difference I ever found between the Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership is that one of them is skinning you from the ankle up and the other from the neck down. In a national radio address in February 1934, Huey Long unveiled a plan called Share Our Wealth, a program designed to provide a decent standard of living to all Americans by spreading the nation's wealth among the people. Long, Huey Long that is, proposed capping personal fortunes at $50 million through a restructured federal tax code and sharing the resulting revenue with the public through government benefits. Later revisions included capping fortunes at five to eight million, annual personal incomes at one million, or 300 times the average American income, and limiting inheritances to five million per individual. Long's program advocated free higher education and vocational training, pensions for the elderly, veterans benefits and health care, and a yearly stipend for all families earning less than one third the national average income. Enough for a home, an automobile, a radio, and the ordinary conveniences. Huey Long also proposed shortening the work week and giving employees a month vacation to boost employment along with greater government regulation of economic activity. By the summer of 1935, Huey Long's Share Our Wealth Clubs had seven and a half million members nationwide. He regularly garnered 25 million radio listeners, and he was receiving 60,000 letters a week from supporters, more than the president. It appears that these views of Senator Long are what made him dangerous to the shadow government. He spoke for the common man. He was not in favor of corporations or men amassing wealth based upon the slave labor and blood sucking of the poor. He was against the powerful moneyed interests of Wall Street and the Federal Reserve and bankers these words spoken by Senator Long in the early 1930s reflect the reality and economic condition of America and the American people today, especially concerning wealth and inequality. Wealth inequality and the greed of Wall Street financiers and the Federal Reserve System caused the recent deep recession in this country under President George W. Bush, from which the Obama administration is still trying to guide America into recovery. Do you remember Occupy Wall Street? The movement started by young people that began in New York protesting in front of Wall Street. 
their demonstrations which occurred all over the country was an effort to dramatize the condition of wealth inequality in the United States. Senator Long's assassination occurred in the Louisiana State Capitol in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he was shot on September the 8th, 1935, and died two days later on September the 10th. He was 42 years old. There has remained a cloud about him and over the true reason for his assassination. But the point is that even if you are considered powerful, when you seek to expose the real powers that are in the shadows who misuse the people, then you become a threat and your life is in danger. And the threat of assassination is ever present. So the scriptures say in Psalms, the 23rd chapter, verse four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Mr. Dolan concluded his remarks on secrecy being a threat to democracy by stating, quote, last year, one example only, it was learned that the Pentagon spends some $4 billion a year to sway public opinion. How do you sway public opinion? What is the mechanics of that? That is, you pay people to write certain things, to feed the public, to get the public to think a certain way and to act a certain way. How much of what you read in newspapers and magazines and see on television, how much of that that you hear on radio, how much of what you read can you trust? Because they usually have one lie backing up another, backing up another. That is why they need so much money every year. Everything that the enemy puts out is suspect. Look at how many reports that are in the media about this drug or this cancer and what this drug can do or that drug can do. And then six months later, there's another report saying, well, that one was flawed, but this is now the new report. So the public becomes so confused. We wrote and published a book on the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. And the same people that we quoted, Dr. Harold Brackman, was hired to come back and rewrite and to give the lie to what he wrote and what we asserted that he and others wrote, or to say that we didn't quote him right. Boy, this enemy is absolutely a liar, as Jesus said, and the father of lies. If your president is someone who the American people have elected to guide them and to solve the critical problems of the time and even to save America in this time, why would they not be given knowledge that can inform their decisions? Others who have this knowledge can manipulate presidents. 
next week god willing we will continue with this shadow government don't miss it tell all your friends about it because this is a secret they don't want the people to know so tell everybody tune in tune in the shadow government is being exposed thank you for listening and May Allah grant you the light of understanding as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. On February 24th, 2013, during his Savior's Day address, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan introduced Muhammad's economic blueprint to end poverty and want. Seven days times one nickel a day, 35 cents a week. Do you have it? Yes, sir. Isn't that painless? Yes, sir. You know you don't like pain. Yes, sir. Look at this. 52 weeks in a year, so that amounts to 18 dollars and 20 cents per year and if everybody in this room everybody listening by television everybody under the sound of my voice gave 18 dollars and 20 cents a year multiply that by 16 million in the working force now we got 291 million 200 thousand dollars in just one year 291 million look at the power of pennies nickels and dimes if all of us did this can you see the picture look we want to do exactly as Isaiah the prophet said they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. With your support of Muhammad's economic blueprint, we can obtain farmland, build industry, and create jobs for our people. Through pooling our nickels, dimes, and dollars, we can rebuild the wasted cities and provide a future for our children. To support Muhammad's Economic Blueprint, go to economicblueprint.org and register now. Are you in agreement with what we must do to end our poverty and want by accepting a program to put our nickels, dimes, and dollars together and make them work for us as a people. How many of you are in agreement? Would you just raise your hands?